Okay, so we're back. We're going to talk about scientific notation and SI prefix. It's basically the number part. So we've done the units in the first few pages. Now we're going to do the number and then we'll combine them to make a quantity, okay? Now I'm going to recommend that you run off and grab your calculator before continuing here, right? So just pause it, go grab a calculator. This is the one I'm going to be using. It's a simple $10 calculator, okay? This is what's recommended. You can use the expensive calculator, right? But it doesn't really help. It's actually easier to use one of these, okay? So this is what I'm gonna use. All right, so scientific notation Scientific notation and SI prefixes help you express either large or small numbers more conveniently. Unfortunately, chemistry is the science of large and small numbers, right? So the number of water molecules in a drop was a huge number, right? Okay, or the mass of one water molecule in grams would be a tiny number, okay? So we have to be able to easily quote large and small numbers in a convenient way, right? Okay, so chemical problem solving often employs, you know, using very large or very small numbers. How do we make that kind of process easier, right? So remember, in one drop of water, there was a one with three, six, nine, 12, 15, three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21 zeros. Number of water molecules in one drop is a thousand billion, billion. A one with 21 zeros, also known as the bare defense. That's a joke. <laughs> All right, so a thousand billion billion molecules in one drop. Now, if you have a simple calculator like this, try and get that number on the screen. Well, you get to 10 digits and you run out of space, right? Obviously on a more expensive calculator, you could squeeze it on, but it's a problem, right? So we've got to be able to get numbers like this on a small screen. Okay, so what's the easier way to do it? Now, you've probably seen this before, high school or different chemistry class, right? What's the way to do it? What's the way to do it? You're shouting at the, at the, at the screen right, right, right now, aren't you? Right? Powers of 10. Okay, so powers of 10 notation, the scientific notation, engineering notation, so there's different kind of dialects of powers of 10. We're going to use, because it's science, scientific notation. Okay, so using scientific notation or powers of 10 notation, we can more easily put numbers like this onto the screen of the calculator. Okay, now you've probably done this, so we'll do the example in a second. Okay, we'll do the example in a second. We're gonna turn eight million into kind of a more convenient kind of expression, right? Okay, but before we do that, I wanna kind of reiterate a key point here, right? All measured quantities have a number and a unit, okay? Everything we do in science involves measurement. We're measuring things. They're called quantities, right? There's always a number in front and a unit in the back. I weigh 200 pounds. I don't weigh 200, I weigh 200 pounds. There's always a number and a unit that makes a quantity. Any answer that doesn't fit that description is not quoted with a number and a unit. It's points off, right? So you always got to quote number and unit for a measured quantity, okay? So 8 million people, that's the number and that's the thing we're counting. People, that's the unit. So things, right? You count stuff. You count what, right? That's the unit. Things you're counting are the unit. So 8 million people, number, unit, quantity. Okay. So in an everyday way, 8 million is the number and people, there we go, is the unit. So 8 million people, number, unit, together they make a quantity, right? Now back to what we were talking about. How do we turn 8 million into a quote unquote powers of 10 notation. You probably remember this from high school, right? Okay. The answer is this. Just pause and write down what you think the answer is. It's going to be 8 times 10 to the 6. People. Okay. Number and unit again, right? Okay. Now, the $64,000 question is how did you turn this into this? Okay. 
what works better is if you write down your own definition rather than I tell you. Right? I'm going to tell you in a minute anyway, but think, hey, how did I get from here to here? What did I do in my head to get there? Okay, this is how I think about it. <clears throat> okay, so for large numbers, anything bigger than one is a large number. Anything smaller than one, a fraction is a small number. For large numbers, what do we do? Count the number of decimal places that must be moved that way to make a single digit. Jumps, number of jumps equals power of 10. So like, so if I had 8 million, right, that's the decimal place, that's the ones, tens, etc, right? So I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 jumps to make an 8 by itself, right? So that's 8 times 10 to the 6. There we go. All right. So if you go back, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to get an 8, 8 times 10 to the 6. All right. So we're converting the number part. All right. Okay. So, jumping the decimal point, so to speak, is kind of a manual way to do it, okay? But there is a special button on the calculator, it's kind of a get out of jail free button, okay? So, now my calculator is a little kind of <laughs> fidgety with this, but there is something called mode 8 here, SCI, right? Okay? So, you can put it in, see if I can do it, right? So I want it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll fiddle with that. On my normal calculator, it's easy to get into the mode, okay? But most calculators actually have an SCI button. If you just press the SCI button, it puts it in scientific notation mode, and it expresses these numbers kind of automatically, okay? So, <clears throat> what I want you to do, get your calculator out, try and get it into scientific notation mode, and I'll try again, all right? So, mode eight. There's shift mode. Hmm, not working. Yeah, I'm going to pause a second and I'll come back in a second, all right? All right, so I eventually got my calculator into uh, scientific notation mode. It should be easier. I should just press mode and 8, but I uh, know it's a bit twitchy, this one. My advice is not to get this calculator. <laughs> okay, all right. So hopefully you got it into scientific mode, whichever way your calculator does it, okay? That's kind of a get out of jail free card, because if I did 8 million, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's the number we just did earlier. And if I press the equals button, when in scientific notation mode, it gives me eight times 10 to the six. So that is times 10 to the six, all right? Okay, so this is a good way to check, put your calculator in scientific notation mode, or just do the manual jumping, okay? So if we look down here at this first example, you know, the manual jumping, just move the decimal place to the left until you get a single digit. The number of jumps is the power. So 3,000, three jumps. 3 times 10 to the 3, right? If I put that in the calculator, 3, 1, 2, 3 equals 3 times 10 to the 3, okay? Now, when you write answers, make sure they're in true scientific notation mode. I don't speak Casio, right? So you can't write just what appears on the calculator. You've got to convert that to what we understand to be true scientific notation. All right. Now, what I want you to do, great place to pause and try, right? Okay, great place to pause and try. Here's some examples, 100 miles, 1,000 students, etc. okay? Turn it into a regular quantity, you know, like 3,000 is a regular quantity. And then the power of 10 quantity, okay? Pause there, come back, okay, let's take a look. So, regular quantity, 100 miles, there's the 100. You gotta put the unit, right? Number of unit makes quantity. Two jumps, one times 10 to the two miles. All right. 
1,000 students. 3 jumps. 1 times 10 to the 3 students. Number and unit. 5 million. 5 with 6 zeros. People. Alright. 5, 6 jumps. You can actually try that one on the calculator. All right. 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 5 times 10 to the 6, 6 jumps. 20 million dollars. Now units for currency, you can put the word on the end always, right? But you can put the unit for currency in front. 20 million dollars. A 20 was 6 zeros, right? Now careful, when I count up to a single digit, it's 3, 6, and then one more makes 7. So it's 2 times 10 to the 7. You want to try that, right? So 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2 times 10 to the 7, right? Careful, there's a difference between engineering and scientific notation. That would be 20 times 10 to the 6 in engineering, which we'll talk about in a minute. But hey, it's one digit for science, right? So 2 times 10 to the 7. All right. Last one, five and a half billion. So five and a half billion is five billion five hundred million. All right, people. Now here we have our first non kind of round number, if you like, right? So I'm going to do the same thing: three, six, one, two, three. I'm going to get five point five times ten to the nine people. Okay. So careful there. Okay. In our first example here, we want to get a single digit, right? It just happens to have all trailing zeros up here, so we don't write the zero, right? So here it's actually 5.5, right? So 9 jumps to the get the 5, and it's 5.5 times 10 to the 9, okay? Do that on the calculator. Actually, I don't think I'll squeeze it on there, so... <laughs> if you're a nice calculator, try it, okay? All right, so hopefully that's just a refresher. That makes sense, okay? Now... <clears throat> So scientific notation is a power of 10 notation. It's different than engineering, which is a nice other way to do it, but we don't use it in science. There's a trick for that I'll show you in a minute, okay? So get it into scientific notation mode or just the SCI button on your calculator when you have big ones like this, okay? So, <clears throat> actually, let me rephrase that. If you have a big one like this, you can't use the calculator unless you've got a nice calculator, okay? So all I'm gonna do for this one, there's my number of molecules in the drop. What is it in scientific notation? So 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21. 1 times 10 to the 21 molecules. Okay. All right. So bottom line is in science, and in chemistry in particular, where we routinely deal with big and small numbers, Anything bigger than around 100, you should really put it in scientific notation. Anything smaller than 0.1, works with small numbers too, do that in a second. Also scientific notation. If you always put it in scientific notation, it will never be wrong, okay? It's just that where we live, between 0.1 and 100, that's our everyday experience with numbers. Yeah, you can quote them directly, right? So the number part has to be in scientific notation if it's above where we live. So anything bigger than 100, scientific notation. Smaller than 0.1, scientific notation. All right, so let's talk about small numbers now. So it's a very similar concept. We're going to jump the decimal place, but we're going to go in the other direction, okay? So we're going to go 1, 2, 3, so it's going to be 1.25. Now here's the thing, right? We're going to put it to the power, but it's a negative power, right? So that's 1, 2, 3, minus 3, okay? So 1 over 10 equals 1 times 10 to the minus 1, okay? So when you divide by something, it changes up here as a negative power, right? So a tenth is one decimal place, a hundredth is minus 2, a thousandth is minus 3, so 1, 2, 3, okay? So 1 over 10 to the 3 equals 10 to the minus 3, right? It's a thousandth, right? Okay? So the bottom line is, you move it to the right to get a single digit, and it's a negative power, so thousandth not thousand. Plus power is thousand, minus power is thousand. Okay, so try it again. Okay, so here's another table. Give you a few minutes. Just convert these things over, okay? Convert these things over using scientific notation. Okay, you can use the calculator if you wish, or you can do it manually. I suggest do it manually, then check it on the calculator. Okay, pause there. All right, come back. So first one, 
let's just look at it. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four jumps to get 1.5 times 10 to the, let's just count that, one, two, three, four, minus four unit grams. Okay, don't forget the unit. All right. If I do that here, point zero 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 one five equals 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay. Now, here's an interesting trick, right? A little trick is 1, 2, 3, 4 jumps, right? So 10 to the minus 4. Okay. Here, just the one jump. 1.25 times 10, oh, 10 to the minus 1 percent is actually a unit. Okay. And this one here, 1, 2 jumps, 4.58 times 10 to the 1, 2, minus 2 milliliters. Okay. Remember, a number and unit every time. All right. So now you can convert large and small numbers from regular form to scientific notation. Oh, a little trick also. If you put your calculator back into regular mode and you program in a scientific notation number, it will convert it to a regular number. But that's really for the next piece down here. Okay. All right. So, so manipulating large and small numbers. So... We've expressed regular numbers in scientific notation, fair enough, right? But how do we tell the calculator a number in scientific notation? You may be tempted to just read this directly. You may be tempted to say for this first one, for example, 1.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4. Oh, let me get that down. 1.5 times 10 to the power of minus 4. And you get it wrong, okay, because that's a mathematical operation, not a number. Remember, this is a number, right? It looks like a math equation, but it's not. Okay, it's very, very important, okay? So what I'm going to do, get that calculator back into regular notation mode, okay? See if mine will behave here, okay? Okay, shift mode 4, okay. This is why I'm having a problem with my calculator. Right. Okay. All right, I have to pause again while I bash these buttons. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> All right, my calculator has now decided to behave itself. So I've got it back into kind of regular mode, so to speak, okay? So flow mode on some calculators, norm on other calculators, okay? Now, how do we get this into the calculator? Okay, now this is a very, very important thing. You've got to look for these buttons, okay? You've got to look for the EXP, or the EE key. There's my EXP right there, okay? Now if I want to put 5 times 10 to the minus 1, which is 0.5, right? This is how I do it. Okay, I'm going to go 5, and then the times 10 part, that's the EE button, right? Or an EXP in this case, EE. And then sign change, not subtract, but sign change, right? So look for your little plus minus key, there's mine, right? And then 1. And because I've got it in regular mode, I press equals, I get 0.5, right? Okay, 0.5. Okay, so that's it. This part here is the E, E, E or EXP key, right? Okay, so let's do the next one together. Or you can actually, if you want to pause it, if you feel comfortable, just do it, right? But I'm going to go through them in a second. All right. All right, so let's look. So next one, show you here, 1.5 exponent 3. 1.5 thousand, right? So 1,500. There it is. Now if you're tempted to just tap that in as it looks, you may or may not get the right answer and it's a good uh, time to learn this correctly, okay? We'll show you how wrong it can get in a moment, okay? So always use the EE key to put stuff in the calculator. So this last one, 3.56, that's 10 to the minus 3. Let's try that again. 3.56. <laughs> yeah, my calculator is not playing games. Oh dear. I'm going to have to trade you in, calculator. The answer is, oh, actually, here's a trick, right? Because it's minus 3, it's the third decimal place where I start counting. So 0 0.12356. All right. Okay, now, so there we go. There's our uh, correct answers. All right, hopefully that all makes sense, okay? Use the E key, E E key, or the EXP key to tell the calculator, hey, calculator, this is a number, okay? Now, 
Just to show you how wrong it can go, I want you to work out this one in two different ways, okay? I want you to work out correctly 3EE7 divided by 6EE3, which is, you know, 30 million divided by 6,000. That's what it is in kind of real numbers. But hey, you're using scientific notation. 3EE7 divided by 6EE3. Get an answer, right? Write it down. That would be the correct answer, all right? And then I want you to do what it says, okay? Follow exactly, and this is how people have been getting away with it for years, and they're gonna run into a world of hurt, right? So if you tap in three times 10 to the power seven, just numbers on the calculator, divided by six times 10 to the power three on the calculator, you'll get a different number, okay? So let's do it. So if you do it correctly, you get 5,000, five times 10 to the three, right? If you did three times 10 to the seven divided by six times 10 to the three, that's 10 to the X's, right? And then equals, what'd you get? You get five times 10 to the nine, you get five billion rather than 5,000, right? Because you've done math, right? You can't swap math for a number. I'm a scientific notation, that's a number. It's 30 million, that's a number, right? That's 6,000, it's a number. You've got to tell the calculator, hey, you're dealing with two numbers. You're just dividing two numbers. You're not doing math you're dividing two numbers, okay? So this can go horribly wrong once division start to come in, right? Okay, so you may have got away with it for now, but you gotta scrap that. You gotta just use the EE key and the EXP key, and it's really gonna hurt you if you don't do it, okay? You can MacGyver parentheses and all this, and, and the MacGyvering just gets worse and worse and worse, and eventually it just falls apart. So learn how to use the EE EXP key to express scientific notation. All right. So, key fact, always express powers of 10 with the EE or EXP keys, okay? It's not a math function. You're telling the calculator it's a number, okay? Now, Trying to make things even simpler, okay, now this is where engineering notation can help just a little, okay. Now, for certain powers of 10 in our scientific notation, you can just swap out that power of 10 for a letter, okay. And these are the common ones here, okay. Now this is going to be on a data sheet, you don't need to remember this, but through use you'll kind of get to know it. All right, I'll leave that on the side for a second. All right, now what we're gonna do, well, <clears throat> and just to go back, those things are called, it says symbol, but I call it a decimal, and the book does, prefix. Okay, so these are decimal prefixes. So kilo is a decimal prefix. We've seen kilogram on the first page, right? So kilogram, that K means a thousand, right? So a decimal prefix is a letter that represents a power of 10 number. Okay, now let's do this first one together just to show you how it works. Actually, let's do the, the, uh, the example right here. So an example right here, I've got 1.25 times 10 to the minus three grams, right? Turns out, if I look on my list, 10 to the minus three is actually milli, right? So all I'm gonna do is swap milli for 10 to the minus three. And there it is, right? So 10 to the minus three grams is a milligram, so 1.25 times 10 to the minus three is 1.25 milligrams. Okay, so that's the trick, okay? So turn this into a regular scientific notation quantity, number and unit, don't forget. And hey, just look to swap the power of 10 out for a letter from this table. Maybe we do the first one, you guys can then do the rest. So I'm gonna go one, two, three jumps, 1.5 times 10 to the minus three, right? Grams is the unit, so that's 1.5 milligrams. Oh, milligrams. Okay, try the rest, try the rest. All right. Okay, you're back, so here, one, two, three, four, five, six, 2.0 times 10 to the minus six meters. Look in our table, 10 to the minus six is that U, right? It's a micro, the symbol name is mu, all right? 
if it's micrometers. Okay. Or you know, if it's meters in particular and it's 10 to the minus 6, that's kind of the width of human hairs and things like that. So that's a micron. That's two microns. That's a trade micrometer, micron, just for length. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that minor technical difficulty. <laughs> okay, so this next one here, it's kind of interesting. We have $30,000. So if we do that in scientific notation, it's four jumps, three times 10 to the four, right? Okay, but if we look at our sheet, bit of a problem, okay, because there is no multiple of, well, there are all multiples of three when you look at them. There's no four there, right? So it's three, six, nine. There's no four. So the question is, how do we kind of convert three times 10 to the four to the nearest power with a multiple of three, which then we can convert to its decimal prefix, okay? And the trick is, and this is where the engineering function on the calculator comes in, okay? Now this one, it's not in the mode, luckily for me, right? It's actually right here, okay? So if I put 30,000 in here, two, three, four, 30,000, right? Then I press my engineering key. I get 30 times 10 to the three. Makes sense, 30 times 10 to the three is the same as three times 10 to the four, right? Okay, so I can kind of write that on the side, 30 times 10 to the three. Then I look up three, and it's kilo, right? So it's 30K. Joliet Junior College Sixth Chemistry Teacher, 30k per year. You often see that in kind of uh, abbreviations in job ads, right? Okay, so <clears throat> get out of jail free when you have a non multiple of three up here, so there's no associated decimal prefix. Just tap out the same regular number in engineering and you'll get 30 times 10 to the three rather than three times 10 to the four. Now, if asked for scientific notation, it's always one digit, right? So don't confuse the two, okay? Engineering notation is a shortcut for getting to a decimal prefix. Okay, you can use that same trick here, right? So 12 million people, 12 million and 12 with six zeros, right? So if we count that up, <laughs> yeah, well, we could use it as a guide, right? So if I count out three, six, that's 1.2 times 10 to the seven people, right? Obviously there was no, 10 to the 7, the nearest is 10 to the 6, right? So 1.2 times 10 to the 7, if you put it in engineering notation, I don't think it's going to fit, but uh, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah, it does. Okay, just about fits there, okay? Put it in engineering. Twelve times ten to the six, right? So twelve times ten to the six is one point two times ten to the seven. Twelve times ten to the six is twelve. Ten to the six, mega. M for mega. Mega people. Okay. So get out a jail free card, the engineering function, okay? Use it as a way to get to a decimal prefix if you have to convert to a decimal prefix for something that's not a multiple of three in the power. Okay, those last two were seven and four. Okay, now, we use decimal prefixes all the time. Maybe we don't think about it, but we do, okay? So, <clears throat> did you open your own electricity bill? It's in kilowatt hours equals a certain number of dollars, right? So kilowatts, okay? Do you listen to the radio? 101.9 watt, megahertz, right? Mega is million, so 101.9 megahertz is 101.9 million radio waves per second, because hertz is a cycle per second, arriving at your radio, okay? Words, nanotech, 10 to the minus nine is nano, nanotech. We saw like in an earlier packet, atoms are on the order of a nanometer big. So nanotechnology is atomic scale. Microscope, see things on the micro scale, okay? If you're on a computer, how fast is it? 1.8 gigahertz, right? Giga is billion, so 1.8 operations per second gigahertz. Drive a car in Canada, street signs are in kilometers. Kilometers per hour speed limits, okay? Kilograms for, for ham in the supermarket, okay? So we see these things in everyday life all the time, okay?
Now, a couple more pages then we'll uh, take a little break and do the remainder in another video. Okay, so maybe four or five pages left. Now to this point, we haven't really talked about rounding off. Okay, so you know, we like to round things off to the right number of significant figures. Okay, and the question is where do you stop? If, let's just do a quick calculation, right? What is uh, one divided by three? Well, it's 0.333 recurring forever, right? We can't write that on the page. We just can't write forever. So we have to truncate it. We have to stop somewhere. Is it 0 0.3, 0 0.33, 0 0.333? Where do we stop? Okay. Now, where we stop, the number of digits is called the number of significant figures. Okay. So significant figures, what are significant figures? They're a measure of how well something can be measured. So that's the key word, measured, right? So the number of significant figures is really a measure of accuracy. Yeah? So the more significant figures you have, the more accurate your measurement. So significant figures are wrapped up in measurement apparatus, like a ruler or a balance and things like that. Each of them gives you a certain degree of accuracy, a certain number of significant figures. Okay. Now, keyword measurement. So therefore, if you think about it, exact quantities it's not that they don't have significant figures they have an infinite number there are exactly 12 eggs in a dozen so that's 12.000000 forever eggs in a dozen right so there's an infinite number of zeros following okay an infinite number of trailing zeros is an exact number it's an infinite number of significant figures right so exact quantities or if you like definitions have infinite sig figs right sig figs so when we do significant figures, we've got to first decide, hey, is this a measured quantity? If it is, significant figures apply. If it's not a measured quantity, significant figures don't apply. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to measure a couple of things. I've got my ruler over here. Excuse me. All right. So we'll use this ruler to actually measure a few things, right? Okay. So object, pen. How long is my pen? Well, this ruler goes to the nearest millimeter and it looks like, if you look at it, 15.8, right? Let's do that again just to make sure. No, 14.8, my mistake. 14.8 centimeters, okay? How many digits are there? Answer is three. I go to the nearest point one of a centimeter and nearest millimeter, that's three significant figures. I do SF for meaning significant figure, right? Sig fig. SF significant figures. Fair enough, right? How about the stopwatch, right? That is 5.3 centimeters. How many digits were there? Two. So as the thing got smaller, it got closer to the tolerance of the measuring device. This goes to the nearest millimeter, right? So the closer I get to the millimeter size, the less number of digits I have. And then finally, let's do the width of the pen here. The width of the pen, let's get it so it's kind of making sense, 0.9, right? Let's call it the lid, 0 0.9 centimeters. Now, significant figures are all about measurement. Am I measuring anything with this zero? No, it's nine millimeters wide, right? Or 0 0.9 of a centimeter. If you like, there's loads of zeros up front here which aren't measuring anything and they're in front of every number. We just don't write them. It's like the speedo on your car, the mileometer on your car, right? You buy a new car, it's got one mile, but it reads 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0001. It's not measured anything up in those tens, hundreds, etc. right? So that's not measuring anything. One measured digit one sig fig. So significant figures are all about measurement and how many digits you get out of the device you're measuring with. Okay. Now, when it comes to figuring out the correct number of significant figures to put in your answer, there's some rules and regulations. Okay. So you may be asked to quote to three significant figures, one significant figure, three, four, one, whatever the number is. And the number of significant figures you quote in your answer depends on the worst measurement. We'll talk about that on the next page, okay? So the, the, you'll know how many to round off to, okay? But there are some rules for rounding, okay? So maybe you've tried this before, maybe you've seen this before, okay? Rounding, yeah. So 
try and round these numbers off to three, one, three, four, one, and then one significant figure. Okay, you're going to get a couple wrong probably. Okay, and I'll show you the correct way to do them in a second. So pause it right there. Try rounding these off to these number of significant digits, and we'll come back. All right, you're back. So three significant figures. Significant figures start when you start measuring, when you get the first non-zero coming in from the left. So that's the first significant figure, one, two, three. The third is zero. That is measuring zero, right? I weigh 200 pounds, not two pounds. So zeros after you've established are counting. They've measured zero in the tenths and zero in the hundredths, right? Now the fourth significant figure is the, zero, is the two there, right? So do I round up? Yes or no? Well, if it was a five or bigger, I'd round up, but I don't. So the answer is 1.00. Okay, now it's just the number part, not the unit. Okay, one significant figure. There's one, there's two. Do we round up? No, it's one. Okay. Now, down here. 569.74. Three significant figures, right? One, two, three, four, five. So it's one, two, three, four, five measured digits. If I want it to three, one, two, three, do I round up? I look at the fourth. Yes, it's five or bigger, so it rounds up to... You got 570, you're fantastic. All right. Four sig figs, one, two, three, four is the seven. All right, do I round up? No. Okay, so hopefully that's familiar stuff, right? You've probably seen that before. Where <laughs> things fall apart a little bit with regard to science teaching and, chem and chemistry in college and high school math is one significant figure here. Okay, now, there's the first digit, right? And there's the second, so we're going to round up. What do you think it is? Well, it's going to be six, right? But it's not six things. Six things is not 600 things. What you're trying to say is 600. And if I write 600 out as a number, it's six with two zeros. That's three digits. That is not one significant figure. I know what they taught you in high school. Put a period there. Eh, we don't do that in science, right? Well, <laughs> not in proper science. Okay, so how do we get around three digits instead of one digit? Get out of jail free card is scientific notation. What's 600 in scientific notation? Six times 10 to the two. The first part here contains a significant figure. So 6.1, sorry, 6.0 would be two significant figures. 6.00 would be three significant figures. Six by itself, one significant figure. So that's 600 to one significant figure. All right. Finally, look here. These aren't measuring anything, right? Significant figures have no interest whatsoever in decimal places. Remember, all of these numbers have all lots of zeros in front. We're just not writing them, okay? So measurement starts here. So nothing's being measured, nothing's being measured, nothing. Start measuring with that one, right? So one significant figure, do we round up? Yes, 0 0.0002, or probably better, two times 10 to the one, two, three, minus four. Okay, all right. So rules for the road then. Okay, rules for the road. As we saw, zeros before the first measured digit. Nope, I'll come down. Sorry about that. Zeros before the first measured digit are not significant. They're not measuring anything, right? They're not measuring anything. So here, these guys weren't measuring anything. That was the first measured digit, all right? Zeros after the first digit, because when you start measuring, you've established measurement, right? So 200 is 200. Zero, zero. You've me measured zero in the tens. You've measured zero in the units. You happen to fall right on 200, right? So zeros after the first measured digit are counting as measured. They just measure zero, okay? So we see that here. So in this first one, that's significant. That's the second significant figure. It's measured to be zero because measurement started there, okay? If you're rounding up, so you're going to three significant figures, you look at the fourth, if it's a five or bigger, it's going to be closer to the bigger number. So round up if the one over from where you want to be is a five or bigger. Leave it as it is if it's a four or less. And then finally, get out of jail free card, maybe this is new, okay? If you want to quote something with more digits and significant figures, just use scientific notation. All right, now the tricks. You can read the book for what you do with addition and subtraction. You may see that on very rare occasions on tests, right? But 99% of your work in science is multiplication and division, okay? And significant figures is very, very easy, okay? So I said before, how do you figure out what to round to? How many significant figures, right? Well, it comes down to this phrase here. 
you're only as good as your worst measurement. If I multiply a number with three significant figures by a number with 500 significant figures, the answer is only good to three significant figures because you're limited in accuracy by the worst number. Okay, or the worst number of significant figures. So my phrase is, you're only as good as your worst measurement, right? Okay, so do the math, right? Just do the math, write down everything that comes out of the calculator, right? And then look through the question and just trim it off to the right sig fig. So let's do this question together, okay? So this will be very useful later for your lab, right? So lead has a density of 11.4 grams per cubic centimeter, right? It has a mass of 2.1 grams, and what's its volume? Now later on, density equals mass over volume, therefore volume equals mass over density, right? So just stick in the, the values, right? So mass, 2.1 grams, divided by density, 11.4 grams per centimeter cubed. Let's get the calculator out real quick. Now write down everything that comes out of the calculator, okay? So 2.1, 2.1 divided by 11.4 equals 0.18421 centimeters cubed. Fair enough, that's what pops out your calculator, but you're only as good as your worst measurement, okay? That has three sig figs and that has two. So the answer is only good to two significant figures. So 1.842, etc. rounded off to two significant figures is 0.18. 0.18 centimeters cubed. So that would be how you would express the answer. Always a point off without the units and a point off without the correct sig figs. How do you know the correct sig figs? It's real easy. People get confused on this, don't. Just look at the question. Whichever quantity in the question has the lower sig figs, two here, two measured digits, that's as good as your answer is going to be. Okay, you can only be as good as your worst measurement for multiplication and division. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, now, <clears throat> we're going to kind of flip it around a bit here. Okay, it's got a few pages left. I want to kind of uh, get as far as I can with this video before one more. Okay, so we're often interested in uncertainty in our measurement, right? How good is our number, so to speak, right? Okay, so we can use statistics for group measurements that you take an average and things like that or you can actually quote for an individual kind of an error limit okay so you can look at group measurements or individual measurements all right now first before we do this okay we have to understand the terminology right so we have two words precise or precision and then accuracy okay so First and the most important question, are they the same thing? Are precision and accuracy the same thing? The answer is no, okay? Accuracy is all about getting it right. If my wife says to me, go and get me a pound of sugar, and I bring back a pound of sugar, that's an accurate measurement, right? If I bring back two pounds of sugar, it's inaccurate, right? Okay, so accuracy is getting it right, okay, so a correct measurement, all right. Precision is really getting it the same every time. So a Swiss watch is very, very precise, right? It measures each second in time very well, okay. Each second it measures is the same, right? So Swiss watches are pretty precise, right? And if you set the time right, they're accurate as well, okay. So precision is getting it right, getting, let me get this right, Getting it the same every time. Reproducibility. Okay, so precise measurement is you hit the same spot every time. Accurate is actually getting it right. Okay. All right, so a good way to think about this is in terms of a game of darts. Yeah. So let's pretend we're playing darts and we're aiming for the bullseye, right? Okay. So good accuracy would be hitting the bullseye. Good precision would be a good grouping of darts all in the same spot, right? So when we look at this, you know, <laughs> kind of Premier League darts player or whatever, right? All four of their darts hit the bullseye, right? So they were aiming for the bullseye, so there's great accuracy, yeah? And all the darts pretty much hit in the same place. It's a reproducible measurement, so the precision is good too. Make notes here. 
Okay, so that's good accuracy because you hit where you were aiming and it's good precision because it's the same every time. There's a very little bit of spread between the darts in terms of where they land. Okay, now this next one, <laughs> well, let's think about that. They're aiming for the, for the middle, right? They're aiming for the bullseye, but they don't hit it at all. So accuracy is very poor, right? They missed the target. Accuracy is terrible. But if you look at it, precision is very good because they're all in this tight grouping here, right? That's what we call a systematic error. Let's pretend you leave a grain of sand on your balance, right, in, in the lab room, and you forget to kind of tear the balance to get it back to zero, and it weighs five milligrams extra every single time. Everything's gonna be five milligrams off when you weigh it, but all the answers are gonna be good, right, into the same kind of point five milligrams away every time. So that's an example of systematic error, okay, if you do the same wrong thing every time, systematic error. Now this one here, yeah, I mean for the Middle, you miss terribly, and the spread's very wide, so poor accuracy, poor precision, okay? So that's a nice kind of pictorial representation of the difference between accuracy and precision for several uh, situations. <laughs> now, it's amazing what you can find on the internet, right? <laughs> so this, I found this picture of someone who went to the, the gun range, right? And he, I think he was joking, let's hope so. Right? He said, I would make a bad murder because he had one good shot which landed close to the bullseye, one reasonable, one reasonable, and then like a bunch a long way away, right? So 10 shots from 21 feet, hit the target seven times. How would you describe accuracy and precision? Well, if you look at individual shots, these are very inaccurate shots, aren't they? Okay, well, and these are bare. So on the individually, there's, there's a mixture, right? But in terms of precision, they're all over the place. So precision, very poor, okay? Individual accuracy is variable, right? Some are good, some aren't so good. Now, here's the thing about random error. Now, in this previous slide, they showed all the darts drifting off this way, right? They went randomly around the board, right? Because if you average out the positions, if you average out these positions, right? If you look here, look here, they all kind of tend towards the center, yeah? So if you do a lot of measurements and then take an average, accuracy greatly improves. That's why we do averages, right? So the more trials you do, the closer to the true value you get with an average. Okay, so individual accuracy is variable, but average is good, okay, because there's lots of trials. And that's how statistics works, okay? So this is why we always do more than three trials in an experiment if we can, because the errors will cancel each other out, and you tend, the average tends to the true value for higher numbers of trials. To get to above six is pretty good, right? So, you know, this kind of carries over to lab, if you've got a chance to do like another measurement, do another measurement because eventually, you know, average at the end, the accuracy will be good, okay? So accuracy, the individual measurements, as we said, are variable. Some, they're all over the place. Some are good, some are bad, but the average is actually very good for this, okay? Averaging works in your favor. Precision, well, terrible, <laughs> right? Precision is terrible, okay, but that's okay because precision, which relates to standard deviation of statistics, you know, it gives you a, a measure of how well you're measuring things, but at the end of the day, do you get it right? Well, yeah, the average gives you uh, the answer you need. Okay, so we talked about systematic error already. We saw that with this example. Talk about the milligrams of sand on the balance. Okay, now when we do statistics, we think about accuracy plus or minus precision. So right plus or minus error. So that's mean in statistics plus or minus standard deviation. And that's how we quote answers, all right? So when we do statistics, the mean plus or minus the standard deviation is the true value. Oh, bring it up. The mean plus or minus the standard deviation for a series of measurements is the true value essentially after, you know, when you get a big number of measurements, plus or minus what we call the error, all right? Okay, so standard deviation, if you ever wondered in statistics, it's a measure of how far an individual measurement was away from the true value, okay? All right, now, <laughs> I won't go into this too much, but um, is it worth it, right? So, 
when we look at individual measurements, are they any good, right? Well, it really depends on what you're using to perform your measurement. If I'm honest, when you measure something on the balance in lab, it's usually pretty repeatable, right? If you actually try this, if you ever go into a lab, just take an empty beaker, take it on or off a few times, and it'll be very different, sorry, very little difference in the numbers on, on the balance, okay? Because they, you know, they're very reproducible in terms of their measurement, okay? But that's not true for all balances. This is a picture of the balance I have at home, <laughs> right? And my wife and I sometimes have this kind of weight loss challenge, right? And um, so we have to measure our weight every week, right? And to make sure we understand who the winner is, we get a balance that goes to 0.1 of a pound, right? Normal balances go to the nearest pound, right? So in this real life example, yeah, I step on the balance a bunch of times. There's 212.4, 212.7, and 212.5. None of those are the same number, right? So it doesn't really give you that 0.1 accuracy, yeah? If I average those, I've got a really good value for my weight, right? But the bottom line is, I'm not going to sit there and average these numbers in my head. I just want to step on the balance once and step off, right? Okay, so this thing, because it's kind of twitchy in that last digit, is very poor in terms of its precision, right? And each individual measurement is probably a little bit away from the average, so it's not so good with the accuracy either, okay? And there is no average function on this balance, all right? So next time you're in Bed Bath & Beyond, do not buy the scale that goes to 0.1 unless you're interested in doing statistics on several measurements, okay? All right, now just to finish off, when we record something one time, so say you put something on the balance in the lab, that last digit, okay, is said to be uncertain, right? So it might be a five, it might be a six, it might be a four. So we quote the answer as the value from the balance plus or minus the error in that last digit. So that's for one, that's for one measurement, okay? So one measurement you do what you record plus or minus a difference in that last digit, okay? For a group of measurements, mean and standard deviation. Okay, it's not really a statistics course, but you need to know these things. Okay, now that's a fantastic place to stop. The last uh, video in the sequence will be temperature and density. Okay, so we'll do that in a little bit.